This podcast is sponsored by Nobody. Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror sci-fi show where things can get totally radical. Now, I am so excited for today's show because I will be interviewing my third Juicy Fruit, my third Beach Bum, my third Undead member, and I'm talking about Jeffrey Commodore. He, alongside two other guests of mine, Archie Hahn and Peter Elbling, or the Juicy Fruits, the Beach Bums, and the Undead in Brian De Palma's timeless cult classic, Phantom of the Paradise, celebrating his 50th anniversary, and I'm so excited that I got him. Oh my God, what a history this guy has. He wanted to be a doctor, and then he went into music, you know, and he wrote uh, songs for the Klinger Sisters, the Midnight Cowboy soundtrack, um, uh, England Dan and John Ford Coley, you know, he, he knew the Eagles. I mean, lots of stuff in this guy's history and show business. It's going to be a great talk today. I can't wait. I talked to him unrecorded on the phone last week. He was a really nice guy. Told me about 30 minutes worth of stories. And I can't wait to talk to him today. And I just love Phantom of the Paradise. I wish I could get get it on VHS on eBay, but it's so damn expensive. Hopefully I'll get a copy in the future. I had one 20 years ago. I wish I still had it. But I love this movie and I love talking about it. And it's going to be a fantastic talk and trip down memory lane. So yeah, here is my interview with Jeffrey Commodore. Hey, Jeffrey, welcome to the show. How are you today? Hey there, I'm good, good. Yeah, this is such a great honor. Thank you so much for taking the time today. <laughs> well, that's funny. <laughs> An <laughs> honor, well, well, I'm equally honored, Dad, and then we're even. Yeah. <laughs> so, going back in time, I know you were originally on the path for medicine, but what age did you start gravitating toward music? I don't know that I ever gravitated. My my family was a musical family. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, my father and my brother both played classical piano, mm -hmm. and we had a a baby grand in the atrium, and it, there was music every night. I wasn't big into classical, and my mother loved show tunes. So whenever my dad would go up to a convention in New York, a business meeting, he was a sociologist. He'd bring back whatever was on Broadway. So we had classical music at night. My mother dancing to Mambo during the day. This is a long time ago. Yeah. And playing songs. So there was just well, plenty of music. I, I, everybody in the family did some music. I studied violin a little, uh, clarinet a little, mm -hmm. um, and ended up actually liking the string bass. But nice. I never, ever thought of it as a career. I never had that kind of talent. Do you remember the first album you ever bought with your own money? I can remember the first album I ever bought with my mom's money. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think I promised to actually stay out of juvie long enough for her to enjoy it. <laughs> it was actually a Kingston Trio album. This oh. is like 1950, what, eight, six, nine, sixty. I can't remember yeah. exactly. Um, it was the, I think it was the Kingston Trio at the Hungry Eye. In, wow! In, uh, in San Francisco, and I loved the energy of that kind of folk music mm. that was energized, and uh, so that's the first album I I, I wanted for me. Yeah, like Roddy Shell introduced them I, at the beginning. Well, <laughs> Say again. Oh, Roddy Shell introduced them at the beginning. Oh, really? Yeah, I, I interviewed him about a couple of weeks ago, and uh, yeah, he was he was their opening act uh, for years, and he used to introduce them, you know, on stage uh, before the show and stuff. Oh, yeah, you know, I, I used to do that for um, oh, Cheech and Chong. Oh, yeah. Cheech and Chong used to be at the, at the Starwood mm -hmm. in Hollywood when yep. I was in my rock and roll days. The Starwood, I mean, they had little... Um, Michael Jackson when the Jacksons were when he was like really small mm -hmm. they had a so they had a music room and they had a they had a a comedy room and so Cheech and Chong were doing the comedy room mm -hmm. and I took a break from recording as a single artist on A&M uh -huh. and joined this band that was led by a guy I knew from New York who later became pretty successful as a songwriter in Nashville um, and so we had this band for a little while they were from Louisiana 
Mm-hmm. So I, I used to say it was three Cajuns and a cracker because I grew up in South Florida. So the, what the management said is, okay, um, before you guys do your rock and roll set, you got to come over to the comedy room and just uh, <laughs> say, ladies and gentlemen, Cheech and Tom. So that's what I used to do. So I, that's how I met those guys. I, I, I talked to Tommy a couple of years ago. Oh, my God. What, what a funny yeah. guy. Just, he's all over the place with his stories. <laughs> I bet. I bet. How about the first concert so, you ever attended? Oh, that wasn't classical because we went, my family went to the symphony a lot, stuff like that. Uh-huh. But um, trying to think, one of the few concerts I remember when I was young, um, I mean, aside, aside from classical music, we really didn't do much in the way of concerts, but I remember going to a King's, no, no, Peter, Paul, and Mary concert. Mm-hmm. Um, I can't remember the year, but it was early 60s. Yeah. And they did a, like an auditorium in Miami. And uh, and I, I liked them. I mean, I liked all that kind of up energy folk type stuff. Yeah. So, so, so folk was your early reference for music um, as far as uh, popular music goes uh, after the classical stuff? Well, my, I have an older brother. He's five years older than me. He's now a retired scientist. And he he got into rock and roll. I mean, he so he brought all the rock and roll home to our our house. So he, he found Bill Haley and the Comets when they first came out with the earliest rock and roll stuff. And, yeah. And then, uh, then he got into Presley. And so I kind of liked it by being around him. Mm-hmm. But I, it was in high school. In high school, I was in class with this girl named Bobby Fye. Uh-huh. And Bobby's older brother had, had was out of high school, but he played sax and guitar. And he played in this band. Mm-hmm. This is what really got me into enjoying rock, that kind of stuff, is Charlie Fye. He, was, he played with, do you remember Charlie McCoy? Yeah. Okay, so Charlie McCoy had a group called <coughs> Charlie McCoy and the Agendas mm-hmm. in like 19, I don't know what, 60, mm-hmm. 61, I'm not sure. But they played around at clubs, and I remember that Charlie took me to see the first rockabilly band I'd ever seen, and that was Charlie McCoy and the Agendas. They were playing mm-hmm. at the Bird Bowl Lounge on Bird Avenue in like, you know, south, mm-hmm. southwest Miami. And mm-hmm. I was amazed. They were so good. They were very Everly Brothers influenced. Yeah. And I remember falling in love with the Everly Brothers in high school. I really liked By high school, I was seriously into rock and roll. I'm Del Shannon, the mm-hmm. Everly Brothers. But Charlie McCoy and the Agents, the first band I ever saw live on stage playing that kind of Southern rock. And what's really interesting, Charlie is such a fine musician. Remember how Roy Clark won a number of years Best Musician in Nashville? Oh, yeah. You know, because that was like a super honor, because those people could play so well. And mm-hmm. so Charlie McCoy won that for a number of years. So here was a guy, I I went for a ride with Charlie. He told me all about his history with the, the McCoy and the Hatfield feud. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> He had this really fast stick Buick, 55 Buick. Anyway, so he was the first like rock and roll guy I ever got to like hang out with long enough to take a ride. And funny thing is, I'm recording my second album mm-hmm. um, that was ever released. And uh, yeah. it was in Nashville. I recorded my second album, for, my, my first album for Epic Columbia. And it was Nashville. And I called up Charlie and asked him to play on my album. And he did. He played mm-hmm. harmonica and he played some guitar. And it was like such a, what, a, what do you call it, coming of age, full circle, oh my God, yeah. this guy is actually playing on my album. And he said yes, yeah, it was so cool. And the funny thing is too, for some reason the musicians used to accidentally send me, send me Charlie McCoy's like retirement fun stuff by mistake. So I'd always get his, his like retirement paperwork. Yeah, <laughs> through the musicians, until I so I sorted it out. So, so that was really very cool. And and Charlie Fye, who played in Charlie's band, or played in bands around there too. He's we used to go hang up. We'd have four of us would share a quart of beer mm-hmm. in high school. We were all poor, and I lived out at the edge of the sticks. And we, 
we would go out to the sticks a little half mile from my, mm-hmm. my house on Snapper Creek in the, in the sticks. And Charlie would bring a guitar and we'd sing rock and roll songs for a part of harmony. So Charlie really taught me to sing with harmony and showed me how to use a matchbook folded up for a pick on a guitar. So he really, and the first time I sang harmony with him on like an old Jerry Reed tune, Jimmy Reed tune. Oh, yeah. You remember Jimmy Reed, amazing guy. Jimmy Reed was um, one of the best blues guys there ever was. One of the absolute best. I fell in love around. I fell in love with blues about that time, and and so the first time I felt my voice sing in harmony, in a, like a blues or a pop thing, I was like hooked. Hmm. But I never thought then it would ever be a career. That never occurred to me. But it did hook me on pop music in a in a I want to do it sort of way. So that's a long story. <laughs> <laughs> Did you start a band in high school? Oh no, no, I no. didn't do. Nah, I just got arrested a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I ran with a. My parents were well off, and uh-huh. like my brother was the older one. He was well behaved. He was in the chess club, the baiting club, and as I like to tell the story, he's like. My whole family is like overeducated. So I, I said, my brother got accepted at Harvard, Antioch, and MIT, and I got accepted at South Miami Jail, Piran Jail, and Surfside Jail. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it was never awful stuff, just crazy kid stuff. We did all kinds of crazy stuff. But I never thought about music until the folk thing came around. Mm-hmm. And I just really liked folk. I know what it was. Um, oh, it's complicated and too long to talk about, but I went into service eventually uh-huh. and when i got out i hid out at this camp counselor job in the middle of nowhere in the poconos of mm-hmm. pennsylvania and I, everybody was playing folk guitar then so i was being this camp counselor and um this guy john cal mm-hmm. you remember danny cal from the blues project oh i remember the blues project yeah okay well danny uh, um Danny Kalb was one of the main members of the Blues Project, okay? Mm-hmm. And I remember when we, we were playing clubs in New York when I was starving musician, yeah. the Blues Project would play a bunch, I think it was a night owl. But his younger brother, Johnny, played a Gibson Dreadnought, beautiful guitar. And, and I never thought of music like that then, but I used to make up these crazy ghost stories to tell my kids in the camp, in the, in the cabin, Mm-hmm. You know, because I was a counselor for a little cabin full of kids. Yeah. And so John would come in and sit on a stool and play all this background music on his guitar. He was a really good guitar player. Like, And and I would tell ghost stories while John played this dreadnought, but it made me fall in love with the Gibson big body guitar. Yeah. I ended up doing most of my writing on my Gibson J200, 1955. So... I mean, it's really interesting how I came and went in music connections for a long time without ever thinking of it seriously. But mm-hmm. somebody, there was a guy named Cutler, Bruce Cutler. I've never heard of him since. I couldn't find him when I looked for him. Mm-hmm. He played a classic guitar, and he taught me how to do some basic chords. And slowly, without realizing, I was getting hooked. So when I, when I went, um, when I was back near my old home in Florida, Mm-hmm. I used to hang out with a, a girlfriend, a friend, friend, who's still a friend. In fact, I wrote my third song, first song that ever got recorded, I think, mm-hmm. um, for for her. Yeah, and, and so I used to hang out at University of Miami Student Union. I loved college student unions, but I didn't love college. Yeah. <laughs> so I would sit there for hours and just play the guitar and sing folk songs. I must have known 500 old English and Scottish and Irish folk songs. I never could sing them very, very well, but but I really I just I liked it. I really liked the folk music. And then slowly as as I got closer to some more rocking versions of folk music, um but basically that's what I was doing. So I started to get some club gigs then. Mhm. And I would play at little coffee houses. And I also did like stupid songs that were funny. And I got hired more for being entertaining and yeah. doing funny songs because I never had a great voice. Yeah. So I got hired to be entertaining. So I would do crazy stuff and I'd do a normal stuff and I'd get away with it and it was, it was fun. And I still hadn't thought about ever doing it from real professionally. It wasn't until I was, te- I was on the faculty at NYU Medical School mm-hmm. in the early 60s. 
I was running a lab. I started working at labs when I was a kid. And, mm -hmm. and I was really interested in, in, in stuff like that. I assumed I was going to go to medical school from the time I was about 11 or 12. So I ended up with this. I had a lot of lab experience. I got a job as a research tech at NYU Downstate Medical School in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. And uh, while I was there, I used to make up satire songs about pharmaceuticals and stuff like that. <laughs> and I used to play at a coffee house. In mm -hmm. fact, Al Cooper and I. I used to run the Hootenanny night. Really? At the Interlude Coffee House out in Queens. Yeah. Remember Al? Yep. I, I, I can name everything time. he ever did. I, I love his work so much. <laughs> yeah, I, Al was really great because I knew him from then. And when we'd run into each other, as he got more and more successful, he was smart. And, and I enjoyed being with him because he was really smart. And, and so... He actually ended up playing on my last album for mm -hmm. Epic uh, that had a lot of good people on. It had the Eagles and had Al and had mm -hmm. Hugh McCracken, who was Elvis's guitar player, and some a bunch of good people. Because yeah. I was friendly with everybody, and so he came and played on my album. But uh, Al, when Al came into the studio when we were recording, I don't know who was in the studio that night. It might have been John Boylan, my producer. Um, Maybe Tim Schmidt, who was still in Poco then, yeah. before the Eagles. And maybe John David Souther, because he sang on a lot of the songs with me. Yeah, um, J.D. Souther. But I remember Al came in to play. I wanted him to play. I was recording a song called Richmond, which I, I find on YouTube occasionally, in which uh, Don Henley sang the chorus with me as a duet. He really liked that song, and he, mm -hmm. he was always going to record it on a, on a country album, but he never did. But... I don't know if Henley was there that day or not, but Al came into the studio and he got that we had the Hammond B3 in there, the organ. And the first thing we all looked at Al and said, play the organ part from like a Rolling Stone. You know, that brilliant organ thing that was so famous. Yeah. And, and Al just did it. He just sat down and played it for us. Absolutely beautiful. <laughs> like, like it was just, okay, no problem. Here it is. And I, I think he actually played organ on, on that song that Henley and I did. So yeah, that was cool. I mean, there's a million stories when you've been in the community traveling for years, right? Of course. How did you come to be Bones Owl? <laughs> oh, um, well, so my band got to be the house band at the Cafe Wa. Mm -hmm. Remember the Cafe Wa in the village? I've heard of it, yeah. Yeah, it was... It was a, like, it was a, you know, like, it was always there. In fact, it was there last time I was in New York and went down and revisited it. But it was just one of the, the clubs that kind of tethered the village, like the Cafe Agogo, the Night Owl, the Agogo, I, whatever. Anyway, so my band is playing, I'm playing bass then because n nobody wanted another rhythm guitar player, which is what I really was into. So um, we were the house band at the Cafe Wa, and uh, you know I totally drifted off the mark. What we were talking about? About being bones sure out. <laughs> oh right. So the girl in our group, Pam, mm -hmm. Pam Robbins. So we had a girl singer, and she happened to know somebody from the Love and Spoonful, I think. Or somebody who knew the Love and Spoonful. Or maybe it was Graham Parsons. She knew Graham Parsons when yeah. he was still around. And I think the Burrito Brothers used to play at the Night Owl. I mean, that place was full of people. Almost everybody I knew, and even me, ended up having some decent success. Who was in that... That's where I made Peter Elbling. Oh, yeah. Originally, because Peter had this really great comedy duo. And he used to play at uh, the clubs there. Um, uh -huh. Like... And he, they were great. So that's how I made Peter so many years before. Yeah. Um, but so somehow I ended up meeting Joe Butler, the mm -hmm. drummer from the Love and Spoonful. Yeah. And I don't know how it happened, but Joe ended up, I guess I played him a couple of the tunes I was writing. And he really liked them. And I would go and hang out. He had a place, <laughs> I think the the... It was like a upscale apart, uh, apartment house, or I don't think it had condos. Then it was in the West Village called the Saint Germain, and I would go up and visit Joe. Now remember, I didn't have a dime to rub together, or, you know, or whatever you had then pennies. But mm -hmm. but I'd go up and visit Joe at his place, 
And there were always famous people coming to visit because the Spoonful is really big and so other big groups. So uh, there I met, do you remember the song Cherish? From who? The Association. The Association. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, huge song. Last time I talked to Terry Kirkman, it had hit two million. This was a long time ago. Two million airplays. I mean, it was harder to get a million airplays than a million records sometimes. Okay? So Cheris was a big kind of classic rock and roll pop ballad thing. So anyway, I met Terry Kirkman there at Joe's place. And at that time, Gary Alexander, who'd been one of the original associates member, had quit. Mm -hmm. And they were looking for an replacement. And I wasn't too eager to join a group with that particular sound, but I sure needed to eat. So Terry said, I think they were sort of considering me to join the association. Because I had played Terry and he really liked the songs. And eventually I was up there one time when Terry was there. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, we got Larry Ramos into the group. And so he became the member and I didn't end up getting in, but I guess he felt like doing something for me. And he said, look, we, we, we got somebody else, but if you come out to L.A., you can stay at my house for a month and I will introduce you to everybody. Mm -hmm. And I thought, that's it. I hated New York by then. And I was I was so hungry. I had malnutrition. And oh, wow. uh, so that kind of clinched it. And I said, OK, this is it. I'm going to L.A. I mean, I had met Steve Stills the night before he left for, met, left for L.A. and a few yeah. other people. And they all seemed to go to Hollywood and come back successful. Did you know Henry Diltz? Like, old, right? <laughs> What's that? Did you know Henry Diltz? Yeah, I knew Henry. He was a big-time yeah. photographer, and so he was he was one of the elders of the village. I mean, all these people were working and successful, and I was just in this house band making no money, but people were nice to us mm -hmm. because we were working there, you know? Yeah. And so, I mean, so, um, yeah, Henry was around. In fact, I think, if I'm not incorrect, that I and my girlfriend and I babysat for Henry Diltz or somebody he was close to, they had an apartment just above Bleecker or McDougal in the village. <laughs> so <laughs> I met them. And, uh, and uh, hmm. so anyway, um, so I got out to California. So basically I, I found a ride with an LVW camper with a hippie sandal maker who was going to LA to sell sandals at the Love Inns in Griffith Park. This is 67. Okay. We'd already made a couple records, my band, uh -huh. and never had a hit with them, but we had managed to get good enough, I guess, to record. We made a record for Vanguard, and we made a record for Dyna Voice. Um, and we made a record called Euphoria, one we didn't write. It was a fun, dope song. Mm -hmm. And Jesse mm -hmm. Colin Young covered it, and they had a success with it. We didn't. I got to know Jesse later and actually opened concerts for him. He's a nice guy. Mm -hmm. So that was interesting. But... So I get out to Hollywood at dawn <clears throat> on Labor Day in 67 at Cherry's house. We get there so early I to sleep, we sleep in the, in the camper. And, oh, and Terry was good as word. He gave me a place to stay. Mm -hmm. And I think the next day or two days later, he brought me over to, I think it was Western Recorders mm -hmm. on Santa Monica, I think it was, where they were recording, the association was recording. And he brought me in the studio, and their producer was Bones Howe, very famous producer who did, he did he engineered for a lot of people, and I think he did some of the Turtle stuff, but he did the Association and the Fifth Dimension and Juice Newton, a lot of film scores. So he had a lot of, he was very well known and respected. He'd been a really good engineer first. So Bones was in the studio, and Terry Kirkman introduced me and made me sit on the piano bench with my J200 Gibson. And, say, and he said, play him Bobby's Blues, which was the third song I wrote. And it's the song when I was writing it that the little light bulb went off and said, you could do this. So then that's when I got really irrevocably hooked. And um, it's funny, yeah, so that was the third song. And so I played it for Bones, and he really liked it, and suddenly I was interesting. And... Um, so it's, there are a lot of other stories, but that's, so that's the long winded answer to your question. That's how I met Bones Howe, who, who that was probably, that was September in November. He said, don't sign with anybody. Yeah. And, um, and then he became my producer. First, he became my publisher for seven years and he became my producer when I made my first record, which was in 68. 
69. I'm not sure for A&M. Bad pick. I should never have picked A&M. I had my pick because David Geffen just said, pick a record company. And you didn't have a deal because Geffen was already real powerful. He was at Columbia, right? He was at at Columbia. It it was A&M Records. Oh, okay. My first. And I put two in the can, made A&M mad, and I never could get it right for them. And I really had bad luck with them. Not that I was magically going to be a success, but so they kicked me off. And then I went to Nashville later to show some songs. And this was 72. Mm-hmm. And I showed all these songs of mine in Nashville. And they all said, nobody's ever going to do rock and roll here. That's, yeah. Nobody's ever going to record those songs. And these two guys, Larry Henley and Johnny Slate, who were producers, I went to try to show him some songs. I said, you know what? We don't know anybody's going to record them songs, but we like you. Mm-hmm. How about we make a record? And I went, okay. <laughs> so we went into the studio. I mean, it was just so fast and present in Nashville. And we went into the studio, and then one day this guy, Don Ellis, came into the studio. And mm-hmm. he was the vice president at Epic, which was Columbia's label. And uh, he, he offered me a deal. So the next thing I know, now I'm an epic record artist. So I made finished the album, and that was epic. And then I made another album yep. after I got with Irving Azov. And that was my last album. Um, and that was in 75, so that had a lot of really good people. And it was a fun album. It's the only one that sold a little. And uh, my record company just douched me. It just really... Yeah. They made me all these promises, and they totally screwed me, and I was actually selling at that time. And I had a quarter million dollars worth of contractual gigs, and I had all these great people in Hollywood who were friends, Mm -hmm. who were going out on the road with the Beach Boys or Paul Williams and all these people for two grand a week, and they would go out on the road with me for 400 bucks because I didn't have a budget. Wow. And then it all came falling down. So that was the end of that. (laughs) <laughs> so I just continued to write. You know? let, let, me know, let me know if I got this right. You wrote and produced a Klinger Sisters song, and now you know me. Oh, yeah, my God, you know that. Yeah, well, yeah. I was interested in production, and Bones had this other guy named Toxie French. Uh, his wife, Gail, I met her. She worked at the Capitol building. Mm-hmm. And... and uh, so uh, somebody brought the Klinger sisters um, to Bones, and Bones had set up for Toxie and for me to co-produce them. And they were doing some shows like the Dean Martin show yeah. and stuff. They were getting noticed. And they were, they were recording a song of mine called the Now You Know Me. And what happened in the middle is that I had an allergic reaction to something. I don't know what. I got stung in the back of the neck while I was on my motorcycle like some kind of hornet. May have been it. I really don't know. Mm-hmm. I've never been super allergic. But I broke out in hives during one of our rehearsals and raced over to a dermatologist. And I broke out like completely. And I ended up hiding in my little mansion in Hollywood for a month, putting on weight, eating ice cream, and being absolutely unpresentable, miserable. <laughs> and while I was doing that, another guy came in and sort of made an off-the-contract record with the cleaners, a real kind of hard rock record. Mm-hmm. like a chick rock record yeah kind of raucous and that sort of that sort of screwed all the agreements and the contracts mm-hmm. it never happened for them and then we never went on i was so disgusted by all this traitors disgusting hollywood behavior because yeah. i was pretty innocent at the time really I just decided, screw this, I'm going to San Francisco, and I'm going to hang out there, because I really always wanted to be in San Francisco since I was much younger. That's where I'm from. So I just kind of <laughs> just kept writing and sending songs to Bones, as, you know, as a, as a writer. Mm. And I went up to San Francisco and did a lot of local playing in you know, the clubs and stuff. And I did concerts when somebody would ask me. Fillmore? So that was what I did for years. What? Did you play the Fillmore and Winterland and all that? No, no, that was for bigger groups. I never got that famous. Yeah, but like, but I was I, there were a lot of clubs that were really good for for media max like me, so I would play. Well, let's see. Well, I played the Troubadour in L.A. and then uh, the the um, Golden Bear in Huntington Beach. That was really a great place. Well, and then there was the boarding house. These were like the clubs that it, if you made records, you could play as an artist. Yeah, and then there were clubs they didn't care. So we played a lot of them. I played this little place called the Drinking Gourd, 
mm-hmm. which was famous on Union Street. Everybody had been there. I ended up buying it at one point. Wow. But there was the coal house, the ore house, the coal yard, the drinking gourd, the Holy City Zoo, the boarding house, a lot of places to yeah. play in uh, San Francisco. And I loved San Francisco. I lived in Mill Valley yeah. up on Mount Tamil Place. It was beautiful. I got a sailboat. I always liked sailboats. Put my sailboat in Sausalito Marina. Mm-hmm. And uh, and sailed San Francisco Bay every day. It was an idyllic life till I had to go back to LA and make more money. <laughs> <laughs> so that's is that enough? That's more than anybody would really like from me, I'm sure. Yeah. Well, uh, I'm born so and raised in the Bay Area. See I'm, if you can keep me from digressing. <laughs> I'm born and raised in the Bay Area, so like, yeah, I mean, I did stand up comedy for ten years. I used to hear all the stories about the Holy City Zoo and all of that. Yeah. Yeah, it's such a beautiful place. It used to be. What happened? I would, I would, I've been back. I hadn't been back for 40 years, uh-huh. 38 years to Hollywood. Once I decided I was done, mm-hmm. had some money, and I thought, okay, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and redo my pre-med and go become a doctor. By then, I wanted to be a holistic one. Yeah. But I just mm-hmm. turned off the tap. I stopped writing, stopped listening, and just studied because it was like a big effort for me. After 25 yeah. years of rock and roll, making some decent money to go to school, holy crap. Yeah. So how yeah, so how's so the Midnight just, Cow how's the Midnight Cowboy soundtrack come to you? Okay, well, uh Bones called me up one time and said there's a movie being made with uh well Dustin Hoffman and John Voight weren't really known then, as far as I remember. Um I don't know, did the graduate come before Midnight Cowboy or Yeah, nineteen sixty seven. Okay, so he was already getting known and Voight had made uh The Water is Wide. Um, and he started to get some notoriety. Anyway, so I heard that they were making a movie, and it was written by Waldo Salt, who was kind of a, a respected writer. Blacklisted writer, writer. yeah. So, but yeah, yeah, and uh, like all the good ones. So they brought me the script for Midnight Cowboy, which I sat up all night and read. And, and they said, we need two songs. This is the first movie that's going to use pop, you know, like popular writers rock writers and they're all going to contribute different stuff and so they said we need a song we need Dustin Hoffman's we need um, Ratso Rizzo's theme yeah and we need a party song for when he gets to seduce uh, Brenda Vaccaro uh, at this party or something like that I think it was Mm -hmm. so that that was my thing so I read the script all night and when I was done reading it I absolutely knew it was going to win an Academy Award. I just knew it. You, start, yeah. you hardly ever know anything for sure, unless you're really successful and can count on your, your wave of power. But um, So I sat down to work on it, and what I did was I wanted to get away from everything in L.A., so I went back to where I'd grown up, that area around Coconut Grove and South in Florida. Coconut Grove was the arty farty kind of area south of Miami. Um, and so I flew down there and got a bicycle and I rented a little room in Coconut Grove and I started working on the, the songs, trying to get the idea. And, uh, and so that's where I came up with I spent a month down there. And then I had the songs and they got recorded and that was nice. Mm-hmm. Very nice. I was really glad to be associated with I wasn't happy with the production that great. But beggars can't be choosers. I was happy to make the money and be associated, but it was a little frustrating. But that's life, you know. Yeah, those songs are beautiful. I have to say, man, you know, and even that Kling, that Klinger sister song we just talked about, I, I like those too. I mean, those are those are some beautiful. Do you songs. really? I'm glad. You know, I listen to it. The other, I don't usually listen to stuff much. Every now yeah. and then, being a doctor for 32 years, mm-hmm. and and I, I work with really complicated cases. Yeah. And I'll go and say, did I ever have another life? <laughs> and so I'll go on YouTube and I'll look and I'll put my name in and I'll see what people have put up. I actually found a, a cut by some popular Brazilian band I'd never heard of mm-hmm. that I didn't even know I had years ago. Yeah, every now and then you'll <laughs> see stuff. So that's fun. You know, I'll put it on and I'll see, oh, that's who you were. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> when you're not fixing migraines or allergies or immunity. So, um, so yeah, 
So the other I'm night, glad you like that though. Oh, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So the other night, I was on YouTube, um, and I saw you in the committee on the Midnight Special in 1973. You, Peter, Archie, Carl Gottlieb, and Valerie Curtin. You're doing some weird stuff. <laughs> How did that come about? I don't remember it. Yeah, you have to show it to me. Yeah, Harry Krishna. <laughs> That was the that was that was the joke of the sketch, you know. Harry Krishna, Harry Krishna. Are you sure I was there? I might yeah. have blanked out. Yeah. Listen, I have a, I have an old friend who's a very talented girl named yeah. uh, Annie O'Brien. She's a singer songwriter, and she I think she wrote a, at least at least one chart record for Carl and Carter. Uh huh. She wrote a lot of stuff, and she's hanging out with the Cashes and and the Carters, and we talk. Uh, she's out in California still, and and we were close friends for years, and. And so we'll chat every so often, and she will tell me all these things about me that I don't remember. It's a little disturbing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, really. But yeah, yeah. I, I, mean, I plead uh, Alzheimer's. You know. When when, we, <laughs> when you were in San Francisco, though, I mean, did you get to go see the committee shows? No, I don't remember. I don't remember. Are you? I'm not even sure I did that show, even though I was great on it. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure I did that. Okay. We'll skip that and go to Phantom of the Paradise. How did that come about for you? Well, for a long time, Paul Williams and I were really close. Mm -hmm. And I met him at a Christmas party at A&M when I was first recording, when I was still had enough status to have a parking space on the lot. Mm -hmm. So it was Christmas, I think the first Christmas when I was on A&M. Mm -hmm. And they, they threw pretty great parties. They had the old... Um, Charlie Chaplin sound lot uh -huh. in Hollywood, uh, off of La Brea, I think. And so they had these book parties, and in comes this little guy with Santa Claus suit. And my girlfriend, she's a dancer, a uh, ballerina. Her father's quite famous, and a movie got made about him called Unbroken. He was an Olympic runner and became a warrior. Okay. So he was like my kind of stepfather-in-law for years. Mm -hmm. Since Cynthia and I were together like 12 years. And... So we're looking, and we both go up to Paul, and we go, we like you. You know, it's hippie days, right? Mm -hmm. And so we just became friendly, and Paul's really fast, witty. Um, I like stuff like that, so we used to hang out. I used to stay at his house a lot. We became close for a long time. Mm -hmm. So one, whenever I'd go back, when I was living in San Francisco, because I'd go back and forth every couple of years, live uh -huh. in San Francisco and live in Hollywood back and forth. So... I'm in town, I go over to A&M, and I go over, Paul had an office in the publishing building, I think, and so I go to say hi, and I say, what are you doing? He's going, he says, I'm making a movie, I'm starring in it, I'm writing a soundtrack. I said, cool, it sounds great. I said, what kind of movie? He says, it's a horror movie, and I said, I want to be in it, I've always wanted to be in a horror movie. Now, I didn't go out for, for much in the way of movie stuff when I was in Hollywood. Yeah. Um, I mean, I wasn't, I didn't want to be an actor, did much too precise work. And so anyway, so he said, well, we're having auditions. Brian De Palma is talking to actors up in my house in the hills. He had this beautiful kind of English country house that had been owned by Ida Lupino and Howard Duff, the TV stars of the 50s. Um, I think Peter Lorre had been there and, and, mm -hmm. and other people like that, steeped in Hollywood, this house. And that's where I used to stay a lot when I was in town. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, I go up there and Brian De Palma mm -hmm. is talking to actors. Well, I don't know how to do an audition. Now, I told you this story when we talked the other day, didn't I? Yes. I suppose for your podcast, I'm going to have to edit myself a little bit. <laughs> it's up to you. Otherwise, you can go all out, you know. Okay, well, here's... So what happened was I go up to a Brian mm -hmm. and... I, get, I would get introduced or something, and mm -hmm. I, he looks familiar to me. There's all these actors there, and I'm thinking, what am I going to do? What can I do? They're acting. I don't act. I'm, I don't have, have my guitar with me. So I'm, I'm looking at Brian. He looks familiar, and we talk for a moment, and I say, you look, do I know you? Did you go to Columbia Film School? <laughs> and he says, yeah. And I say, did you make a student film called Murder a la Mod? And he goes, yeah, and I said, you son of a bitch, my band played soundtrack on your student movie, and you screwed us for 450 bucks. <laughs> His eyes got wide like alfalfa, man. Yeah. He looked so shocked, and I, I didn't even care. I was so pissed off. And then I don't know what happened next, but the next thing I know after that, I was in the movie. 
I don't know if Brian felt guilty or what. Oh, man. Or maybe it was a good audition because I unloaded on that guy. I later ended up liking him and we hung out a little bit. But yeah. But um, anyway, so that was my audition. Uh, I've actually never had quite heard of an audition like that. <laughs> but somehow I got me in the film, and for which I'm very grateful because I did. I always wanted to be in a horror movie. It was a rock horror movie. Yeah. But. I got to work with a lot of really cool people. I got to see what it's like to be immersed in movie making, which was because I always loved movies. And uh, and it was just really quite an amazing experience. And uh, it was fun. We were on location for months in, in Texas, um, mm -hmm. in Dallas, at this old uh, movie theater, The Majestic. And there were lots of girl extras. And I got to sing one of Paul's songs uh, as a solo, and we each had a solo in the movie. Peter, Archie, and me, we played uh, this three-man rock and roll group who was always changing their spots to, to make trends or keep up with trends. Yeah. <laughs> that movie predicted a lot of stuff that hadn't really happened yet. I thought it turned out, I thought it deserved much better than it got. It yeah. came out, and it was a dud. Rolling Stone had, had interviewed me for a half-page article, and then the movie didn't do anything, and they dropped it. So I could tell they really cared about me as a as a Bay Area artist. <laughs> Jan yeah. Wiener, uh, Wiener, no, it's really Wiener. He was catty yeah. with me at the screening. He was very catty. I was disappointed. He was supposed to be cool. Yeah. So anyway, so nothing happened. We were all disappointed. So when the movie ended up attracting such talented people, mm -hmm. Like Del Toro and Wright, <coughs> all these amazing directors who love the movie mm -hmm. and say they're influenced by it. It really felt like it was great, you know? Yeah. And and yeah. the fact that it's actually become a bona fide cult movie is extremely satisfying, I think, to all of us who are in it. Yeah, Peter looked like uh, Alice Cooper with that makeup on, I think. <laughs> yeah, that was before Alice, though. You know, that was at the same time. I actually opened for Alice a couple of shows, but he wasn't wearing that makeup at that time. He's a nice guy, huh? Uh, yeah, very nice. Yeah, yeah, he was nice. Very down to earth. You know, a very different image than the one he projected. He's a good marketer. Uh, anyway, we did a couple of shows in the Bay Area, and that was fun. Um, Tell me about I William Finley. Here I am doing all this feeling songwriter singer stuff, and then there's Alice yeah. having intercourse with boa constrictors or something. I don't know. You know, it's like crazy. <laughs> So, but I do like snakes, so I proved. Tell me about William Finley. Like, yeah, you know, I've tried getting his widow on here. She's not well, apparently, but I think he oh, was she's so. Not? Yeah, Susan's not well. I didn't know that. Yeah, but like, I, I, I think he was just an underrated talent. That guy. Well, you know, I don't. I, we 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 didn't know each other socially. We I saw him a few times in New York mm -hmm. because of the movie. Um, I, and I did a lot of traveling then because I was doing concerts and touring and stuff. So I'd run into people. But as far as on the set, mm -hmm. um, Bill and Susan were really nice. And they, we would hang out in each other's rooms. Um, I think one time I had money and I was restless being on set location. So, I mean, I think one time I, I had this girlfriend there mm -hmm. who was a really interesting girl she was an extra in the movie she was kind of exotic i liked her yeah. and so we were hanging out and i think i i said look let's go have dinner in new orleans because i like to do that when i'm on the road wherever i'm near i would go to new i would fly into to uh louis armstrong airport i think it was and then get a car and i'd go to the quarter which i loved since i was about 12 and go to antoine's which was my favorite old 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 french restaurant Mm -hmm. So we flew down there one time. I got a, I got the rest of them to fly, to fly down. And we went and had dinner at Anton's and flew back. Very jet setting fun. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's as much as I knew knew Bill. I, I When we got together in 06, when they had this big thing in Winnipeg, obviously he'd been ill, but I didn't ask him about it. And But that's as much as I really know. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? We were around each other. We worked around each other. And that was it. As far as I knew socially, he was a nice guy. So Susan was a nice girl. Jessica Harper, is she great? I just think I got along great. We mm -hmm. were fine. You know, I got along with everybody. I was pleasant. Garrett no, Graham, who no. <laughs> played Beef. <laughs> Garrett, yeah. Garrett was always acting like a like a snob. I don't know where he got that stuff from. <laughs> he ended up pissing. I think that I heard that he pissed off the, 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 the text, like the grips and stuff, so oh, okay. much that in the shower scene, Mm -hmm. When he's singing before the Phantom sticks the plumber's helper in his face, remember? Yeah. 
Well, you notice his he, his body got really red. Oh yeah. The grips, well, whoever was in charge of that, they didn't like him, and they kept turning the hot water down till he was freezing. <laughs> That's the story I got, and he's really <laughs> red. It looks like it was true, because he did irritate the shit out of people. I yeah. mean, we got along. <laughs> he always acted snotty, but we got along fine. Wow. So, when did you become aware of the movie's cult success? Um, 16, uh -huh. when, when I, I don't know, it was 14 or 16 when they asked me to come down and sit on a panel, uh -huh. um, at the Cinerama Dome, which was a fixture of my neighborhood in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and Ed Wright was hosting, you know, he'd had that huge success with Shaun of the Dead. Yeah. And I met him and we, he was, he was excited to meet me. Here's this very successful young director. Oh, he was so young at that point. I said, are you an embryo? Were you an embryo when you made the movie? <laughs> he said, well, I was only 25. And I, but, but he was a very nice guy, and we sat on the panel. And it was fun, but the best part of it <laughs> was the Cinerama Dome, I think, seats a 1,000. And every seat in that dome, but a few, were mm -hmm. filled with young people. I said, where the hell did they come from? That's mm -hmm. when I realized that this movie had legs. Wow. That it was becoming popular with a totally different group of people. So that was exciting. And I got to bring my best friend's son, one of my two best friend's sons, mm -hmm. Dash, who actually studied acting. And we had the two last seats in Rama Dome, and he, and he got to watch me in the movie. That was fun. <laughs> and then we sat on a panel, you know. So that was really a great moment. And I realized the movie was mm -hmm. starting to get some survival on it. And now, evidently, it's done. I mean, a lot of people love it. People like uh, Gloria also, Dignazio is, show. you know, keeping the movie alive, you know, with the festivals and stuff. Who was? Oh, yeah, Gloria. Yeah, Gloria. No, I love those guys. So, you know what? Mm -hmm. We went up there in 06, and they all, like, we all got treated like the Beatles on that trip by all these fans who were in Winnipeg forever. I love the Winnipegians. Mm -hmm. I love, they're so good. So... <laughs> My father was a professor uh, um, uh, in Canada for years after he dropped out of the States uh -huh. and ended up being a, pre being a professor emeritus to the Inuit Indians on Vancouver Island before he died. So I spent some time in and out of Canada. Plus, I loved Canada, and I didn't play there, mm -hmm. but I used to go up there quite a bit when I was nearby. I loved the train in Canada, taking the train across Canada. It's pretty. So... Um, Nice. Tell me about um, no, write, Tell me about writing. We'll never have to say goodbye again for England Dad and John Ford Coley. Okay. Um, <laughs> I like that song. So, uh, thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I always, you know, it's never. I always knew it was never a great song for me. I actually proved other people could get on the charts with it, but not me. <laughs> Anybody <laughs> could have a hit with that song, but me. Well, um, I remembered. When I, I was starting to work on songs for my next album, mm -hmm. um, and uh, I had finished my I had finished my Nashville album. I was still you know touring and doing whatever came up. Mm -hmm. I was living in the Sunset District of San Francisco, mm -hmm. um, which is right off the beach there. Gold Beach is really pretty. It's really quiet, nice back then. Yeah. Anyway, so I'm living there, and I have this old pond table. I still have. I'm sitting in the kitchen and, you know, working on songs and I uh, pick up the guitar and I play this little lick that I liked. Mm -hmm. And then the words came to me, turn on the radio, we'll play it way down low. And I thought, oh, that's kind of cool. I like that. What DJ wouldn't play that song? So mm -hmm. I just worked on it for a little while and I got to liking it better and better. It was, it was um, the story of writing that song ended up in a book one of those songwriting for dummies books. Like, you know, those things for dummies. <laughs> oh, God. Really? Uh, so I ended up with a blurb about how songs get written. And the people who did the book called me up and asked me to write a paragraph about how I did that song. But I this, these different girls I dated in the Noe Valley area, hippie girls. I was mm. hung out with the hippie girls. Yeah. And um, one of them had a little KLH radio. And you could turn it down, but you couldn't turn it off. Mm -hmm. And so we'd be hanging around doing whatever people did in those days, which was kind of a little of everything. Yeah. And uh, 
God, what a great time that was. Oh, <laughs> I could be born again as me if I had if I back then. So um, I was just thinking about that radio and turning it way down low. And I had this girlfriend. There was this girl that one of those people had a best friend, a girl from Seattle named Molly Jones. Mm -hmm. And Molly was the daughter of a pilot. And she was a friend of Carol. The girl had the radio. Mm -hmm. And I dated Carol quite a bit. And and Molly came out from San Francisco, and Carol said, you're going to just love Molly. And I kind of just did. And she, we would just talk. There would be get-togethers, and we never, we didn't date, but we talked. And slowly we got to know each other, and in between all this other wildlife. And it was, it was a crazy, wild, open life. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't remember exactly, I think at one point I asked her for a date. Mm -hmm. And we spent a night together, and I really got a crush on her. Mm -hmm. And at, there was a point at which she had to leave to go back to Seattle. Mm -hmm. So she wanted to stop and see, talk to somebody in this bar uh, down in the sunset. I, I had this little Porsche I bought for my brother. Mm -hmm. And that's what I drove around there for all the time. And, and so I sat in the car, she went in, and I started thinking about, boy, I wish you were not going. And we spent this last night together, and I was pretty much feeling I wish this night would never end, you know? Mm -hmm. And which everybody's had that feeling if they've been romantic, I guess. So so that's how the song evolved. And I got into the, I had a stand-up, uh, you know, a, a upright piano in the beach place in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And so I, I went from the guitar to the piano uh, and I started messing with it on the piano. Paul Williams gave me one great piece of advice once. Uh -huh. He said, if you want to write a great ballad, write it on the piano. Because hmm. he used to plink on the piano and work with some very good players. I don't think he played guitar at all. So no. I sort of wanted to see what it would feel like, because it, be it felt like it was going to be a, 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 love, a slow love song. So I got on the piano, and I was working on a thing, and suddenly the chorus came to me, hmm. and I played it pretty much complete and I thought this song is a freaking hit this is a hit song mm -hmm. and then I got paralyzed with fear because I didn't think that way about most of my songs you know I mean mm -hmm. a hit song feels completely different something that's going to get recorded get on charts often feels very different to the writer I think okay mm -hmm. so um, I thought oh my god this thing is a hit so I worked on it every day for four months on almost every drug known to man including <laughs> water yeah I mean, I did everything to my head to keep it open for that song. So, not that I'm encouraging people yeah. out there in Podland, but all artists have been known to do extreme things to stay on on the money, right? Of course. So, so I'm working on it, and finally I, I've got the song, and I'm kind of stuck for a month or two. And I finally get the bridge, which is a very small modification bridge, and that was it. I knew I had a hit. And then uh, what happened to me is somehow, oh, I put it on my album. I had an argument with John Boyle and my producer, and he won, and he wanted it slower. It was really supposed to be played pretty peppy for a pop ballad. So I did not like my versions of it, my version, and I wasn't, it was really hard for me to sing. Mm -hmm. So I did a lot of takes. In fact, his, his brother, Buna Boylan, hung mm -hmm. out in the studio, and they all encouraged me through 12 hours of doing take after take. Well, I got more and more miserable. Boona later had a hit with Ian Matthews, mm -hmm. um, Shake It Baby. Okay. Remember Ian from Fairport Convention? S sort of. Yeah, I wasn't a they, big, four, they, I wasn't a big they Fairport. They had a hit one. with Joni's song. They had a hit with Joni's song, uh, Woodstock. Yeah. Not being in England. He, was in he later recorded one of my songs, which made me feel pretty good, called King of the Night, which is a song I like. Mm -hmm. If you ever get a chance to listen to it, you might like it. I'll check it out. If not, call me sometime and I'll play it for you on the piano. But, <laughs> um, anyway, so I got, after my album's out for a while, um, mm -hmm. and I got the second album deal. At, oh, at the, uh, in Atlanta, there was a place called the, oh, what was the name of that place? Not the Electric Ballroom. Alex Cooley was a famous promoter here in Atlanta. Okay. Area, and and I was playing somewhere. I think the Southeast Great Southeast Music Hall, mm -hmm. where everybody played here, like the like the like the Troubadour, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. 
So I think I went over to this club. I don't know why I can't remember it. Um, and and uh, the Don Ellis, the vice president of Epic, was there, and and. And somebody said, play him that song. And I played him, we'll never have to say goodbye again. He said, I'll give you another record deal. So it was an obvious hit to anybody in the industry who heard it, I guess. Mm -hmm. So anyway, it ended up on my album, and I got a call from somebody associated with the management of England Dan and John Ford Cole. And he said, I'd like to buy the publishing for that song. So I named a crazy price. He said, fine. And since things were slow, because mm -hmm. I had my own publishing by then. So I sold him that song for a bunch of money. Yeah. And then it, it paid them back because it made a bunch more. So that's how it ended up on the English. See, anything they owned, they were very good about money, those bunch, you know. That's good. And so I, uh, I, uh, I knew that if I sold them the song, I actually did it for a business reason more than the money. Mm -hmm. I knew if they owned the publishing, one of their hit acts would record it. Seals and Croft, or England Dan and George, uh, John Ford, mm -hmm. Ford Coley. So, Marie McGovern, she actually did record it and did a good job on it, and it damn near charted at the same time as England Dan mm -hmm. record. Um, so, uh, there was a little blurb on Billboard, a little article that said, it made me feel like I really was being successful. It said, McGovern, England Dan in chart battle over Commodore tune. Wow. I felt famous for 30 seconds. Um, <laughs> that's an extra 15 seconds on Andy Warhol's 15 yeah. seconds, right? Or is it 15 minutes of fame? It's, it's 15 minutes anyway, of fame. So there it is. So that's how that came about. And it, and it, it, it there's longer stories about it. It was actually recorded first. Uh, uh, Clive Davis actually liked the song, apparently. Mm. And he tried to get Melissa... Oh, what's her name? She was... Irritating person. What? What was that? Well, I can't remember the name of the artist. Melissa, somebody. Oh, and Melissa Manchester. Wanted... Yeah, I think that's who. I hope yeah. I'm being right. Well, I'm being offensive. But so it's this group called Dur Durdorf and Joseph, a mm -hmm. duo that was involved with the Seals and Croft people, I think, and they recorded did a nice job on it, and uh, it charted, mm -hmm. but it didn't go very far. So. That was not great fun, but at least it charted. So I don't remember that. That was like the end of the year in 77. Uh -huh. And then they recorded, then England Dan and John Ford Coley recorded it. And Kyle Lenning, the guy who produced it and many other hits, nice guy, came over to my house with Danny, uh -huh. England Dan, in Hollywood. And they said, we made a record. We'll never have to say goodbye again. We'll nice. play it for you. And I listened to it, I said, that's a hit. It's the right speed, and it's right. It mm -hmm. will be a hit. And they said, no, no, we can't put it out as a single. It was just on the charts. I said, it won't matter. If you put that single out, if you put that on a record, they're going to pull it as a single, and it's going right up. I, you know, being right is once, once in a while, it's nice. Yeah. <laughs> but they did. They didn't want to release it. And yet, it got so much airplay, they released it as a single. And it made the top ten. I think it would have made a lot higher, but the Bee Gees had the first four positions locked up like the Beatles. Oh, yeah. So that was frustrating. But I was happy to get top ten. And I think it was number one on the adult charts for something like eight weeks. It, it got, I think at the time I was told it was the second fastest record up the charts, oh. second only to Philadelphia Freedom by Elton. So it was exciting, and it did really well, and I made lots of money from it. And it was nice experience. That, that's you fantastic. Know. you have any uh, good stories about the Eagles? <laughs> you mean that I can repeat? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Yeah, I mean, I spent a lot of time on the road with them. And Irving Azoff, I was in, I was in, I was in, I was in Epic, Epic's office in uh -huh. New York City after I finished my Nashville album right. to talk with some of the people there. And I got a message from one of the execs, and they said, somebody wants to, oh, Carly Carly Simon's manageress is interested in you. She really likes your record. Nice. So this is the 70s, early 70s, where women were all like not liking men much. Yeah. Remember? <laughs> yep. Okay? Of course, I was the guy who always made the bed and breakfast, so everybody liked me. But <laughs> um, 
So I can't remember her name, unfortunately, but she was Carly Simon's manageress. And she said, listen, I've listened to your record. I really like it. It has a wonderful attitude toward women. And I'd just like to say, if you would like me to manage you through the release and the first couple of months, I would be happy to do that for you. I was extremely flattered, you know, yeah. especially coming off that kind of superpower like Carly when James Taylor was around, you know, that was pretty heady. So I said, well, let me talk to my, my attorney and, and I'll get back. And I call up Michael Rosenfeld, who I was very friendly with for a long time, not so later, but Michael was a big time Hollywood attorney by then. And so I called him, I told him the story, he says, no. He says, I got the manager for you, do not sign. Mm -hmm. I said, who? He said, it's the Eagles manager, Irving Azoff, and he wants to meet you. So I said, okay, I'll hold off. So I, I told her about this and I, I went back to San Francisco and I got a, a call from Irving or I called Irving. He said, come down here, I wanna manage you and let's meet. So I got on a plane and I went over to his place on Sunset Boulevard, Frontline Management. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, that's when I, I met the guys, I think, and-, and uh, Oh, Joe Walsh. Joe, yeah, Joe, Joe Walsh. God, blank out. <laughs> anyway, I mean, I knew the Eagles through three iterations, you know, so that group has changed a bunch since I've met them. Um, but yeah, I went up there and, and Irving, talked to me and, and I said, okay, yeah, uh, manage me. And I liked the Eagles from what I'd heard. And this is 74. I think they'd only been around about a year. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I hadn't met Jackson yet or anything. But a different crew and a little bit earlier, a little bit after me, I was a little earlier than them in Hollywood. But um, so I went down there and then he got, I mean, he took me down the street and got me an agent and got me a business manager. I mean, this guy had such power. It was very heady stuff, okay? Mm -hmm. So I ended up going to the studio and I, I was playing at the Troubadour and Irving came in and said, I'd like you to think about having John Boyle as a producer. Now, I knew John from New York when he had a band called The Ginger Men. He's uh -huh. a bright guy and we always got along. And we, we got to Hollywood at the same time and both had a, started having some success. And then he, he went on to have a lot of success and then kind of destroyed the business with having so much success with Boston yeah. that no executive wanted anybody to make an album if it wasn't platinum. It really changed the business, the success mm -hmm. of Boston. Not that it was John's fault exactly, but um, so um, John, I said, yeah. So John produced my album and I started calling people to get them on and everybody pretty much said yes. You know, Glenn Fry never ended up on the album. Um, uh, Don was on it. Tim was on it from Poco at the time. Um, uh, Don Felder was on it, and Joe Walsh was on it. He had, uh, when Joe joined the Eagles, they had a big party, to, to a private party where the Eagles performed with Joe. Right. I think the first time. And Joe came out afterwards and said to me, he says, what do you think? I said, I think this is great for the group. You're going to give them more balls. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. in the rock and roll way. And uh, so, you know, so I went on tour with them. I went on tour with them when it was still Randy and Bernie. Yeah. And it was about the time of the on uh, the Long Run album. Oh, yeah, with the and, Timothy uh, B. Schmidt. Actually, Henley, yeah, and so Han, Hanley, Henley liked the song that I recorded, one of my songs called Waiting for the Last Song to Play. And he said, I'm, I might like to record this. And so they thought about it for a while, which is pretty exciting. Nice. And then when he finished the album, he called me and he said, we finished the album. I think it was 800,000 bucks. I mean, I was like, what? <laughs> and I said, what about my song? He said, ah, we decided to be greedy. So I was very disappointed. I think if they had put the song on the album and Henley had recorded, I would have made so much money. I would have never been able to cut the ties with Hollywood and finally become a doctor, mm -hmm. which I think I needed to do. But it was interesting, so that's how close I got to be more associated. Nice. But I was complimented. I got a compliment from Henley a couple months ago when, when they were here in November, when he said that Richmond, this song that I told you about, was yeah. a significant song. I think coming from Henley, I felt pretty complimented. We used to double date some, Don and I. He's yeah. very bright and fun. Everybody thinks he's sourpuss, but I only knew him as a kind of fun guy to hang out with. So I got in this crew, this different crew overnight by having Irving mm -hmm. take me on. So, so you mostly... Yeah, um, so I answered every insignificant question or history of my tiny history. <laughs> <laughs> 
You so don't you, think about how much you've seen until you get asked about it. It's funny. Yeah. <laughs> so you mostly retired these days? Retired? No, I'm I'm still seeing patients. I, oh, good. I only have one office now. I've had as many as three, but my same original office. I'm still seeing patients. I, I still love the work, and I keep getting better at. It. I keep inventing. I've got a little research company, and I've got some patents on some stuff that's really cool. Yeah. And I've developed some clinical techniques, so it's been, it finally became a creative effort for me. And uh, I started writing again after years of not doing anything. When I found out the same year that Henley did that I had a daughter, that he had a daughter. Uh -huh. I was sure she wasn't mine, but she turned out to be mine. Hallelujah. It was amazing. And then after we got connected, um, she was amazing. I saw her when she was like two. I was sure she wasn't mine. Mm -hmm. She was. She. Her mother was a, a woman who decided that she was going to have a baby for herself and not tell anybody she was dating that that's what she was planning, mm -hmm. which I got really mad about because I thought that was awful without telling, you know, because you yeah. tried to be responsible as a rocker or you hope to be. But anyway, so I really was sure it wasn't mine. It wasn't until my daughter contacted me when she was about 28 that that I told her, we got to do a blood test because I think it's this other guy. And we did it. By the time we did the test, I already fell in love with her on the phone. It's, it's great. Now she's actually vice president at REI. Nice. Yeah, so she's done really well for us. very creative. And she did it because I wasn't around to rock and roll screw her up. Mm -hmm. So, but when I, when I found out she was actually my daughter, I started thinking, if I were there when I should have been, I was still a songwriter. I would have written a song for my kid. So I sat down to write her a song, which I thought she might feel good about. And I did. I came with a song called uh, Grown Up Lullaby. Yeah. And uh, she loved it. And ever since then, I've been writing away. Years ago. Eight years, ten years. I know. About 13, 14 years ago. And uh, since then, I've been working on my death album ever since then. Are you also working on a memoir? No, no. I'm, people have asked me, but you know what? It's like most of the stuff that would interest people is like nice private. Uh -huh. And I'm not somebody who tells tales on people. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. So I, I really don't have I, I don't have anything to say about the things I've seen and been around, you know? Right. Because, you know, people were pretty wild in those days. Mm hmm. So you got. So, so that, that album, is, is it finished? Is it going to come out? Oh no! I mean, I haven't. I'm still writing it, going through. I, I think I've got enough for two albums. I'm still trying to, and I've got some other things that I I really have to finish before that's really something I could do. If I could still sing, which might not be possible, and if I live long enough, mm -hmm. which also might not be possible, that's coming next. Right now, I'm in the process of putting out a commercial version of my second patent, which actually fixes a condition that can't be fixed, just like my first patent. Uh, it's I uh, designed it for people with chemical sensitivity. There's never been anything that worked like a wonder drug for them. And I developed that about 18 years ago. Got the patent in 15. Patent reads method and composition for relief of chemical sensitivity. People who can't be around perfumes, they get sick, yeah. or, or tires, or smoke. <clears throat> I think we discussed it, that, didn't we? So, yeah, so I've been, using, I've been testing it for 16, 18 years, it works about 95% of the time. It's natural, crazily enough, and it doesn't interact with anything else, and it can't hurt you. And it actually fixes people. If you if you had a migraine, if you're in a candle store in about five minutes, you take this stuff, a small dose of this stuff every day for about 10 days, and that changes. So it can bail people out of really bad reactions, really mild reactions. So, so we're about a couple months away from finally having a commercial version. Wonderful. Now, if I can just keep the FTC and the FDA off me while I try to get people on it, that would be nice. Because the natural world is not popular with the pharmaceutical world. No. So. Not popular. Was, was, so so that's, that's what I'm working on now. And I get that product out. If we can get it, like even selling a little, then I can finally maybe think about making my album. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Jeffrey, I thank you so much for coming on today, and I hope uh, you accomplish your goals in the future, and you had some great well, show business great stories. You. you really did. I enjoyed talking to you. I could say I, I could say talking at you, because every question you asked me took me back, man, <laughs> on the highway. Yes. These are things I don't think about, and then they're all there. <laughs>
Except the ones, of course, I don't remember for various reasons. All right. Well, thank you for having me on. I really enjoyed it. When you told me that Archie and, and, and uh, Peter had been on, I figured it's got to be worth doing. So I hope it was. It sure was, um, sir. I, if you had a word counter out, I'd be, I'd be really unhappy to hear the number of words I've used, but that's <laughs> not unusual. <laughs> not many. You didn't swear that much. <laughs> Well, I was just thinking of the total quantity, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think you asked me one question and everything came from that. <laughs> it was fun. It was fun to think about those times, actually. Oh, and also my best affections and hugs to all of the Phantom fans out there. Yes. I'm so happy that people like that film. Bye, Tommy. Thanks. My pleasure. Well, there you have it. Jeffrey Commodore. Ain't he a cool dude? Nice guy, huh? Yeah, he was a fantastic guest, I'll tell you, with all those stories and everything. I'm so glad we got to talk. You know, I've had the Juicy Fruits on, the un the Undead, you know, all those guys. I'm so glad that we got to talk today. Well, until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, there's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Fire, dudes!